Hi, everyone. This is Brian Arcis, Portfolio Manager on the Ford International Fund and Ford Global Equity Fund here in Singapore. I'm joined this morning by Nancy Hasek, analyst on the team in Cape Town. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning, Brian. Following on our podcast last week in advance of the U.S. elections, we wanted to follow up and chat through the results relative to expectations and more importantly, the implications of those results on policy going forward. So first to begin, obviously, the presidential race, as we had highlighted last week, though, it may take a number of days to determine the ultimate winner as states work through their vote count. Um, What we did expect and what the base case in the market was, was that Joe Biden would win the presidency. So over the weekend, we saw that Joe Biden was named the president-elect, with 47 states now being called, three remain outstanding. Um, But with those 47 states, Joe Biden has earned 290 electoral votes. It's likely that of the three remaining states, he may win at least one more, which is the state of Georgia which would bring him up to 306 electoral votes. But in any event, uh, he has already earned enough to become the president-elect. What we got uh, wrong, or at least slightly incorrect, when we chatted last week was just the, the size and scale of the win that Biden was likely to achieve. So it was our expectation, as well as much of the market, that Biden could win as much as 55% of the popular vote, if not slightly more. What we saw last week, and certainly through the counts that ended over the weekend, was that the races were significantly closer across the states than we expected. But ultimately, um, Biden did win 51 percent of the popular vote, slightly more. uh, And obviously, the outcome remains unchanged. He's still the president-elect. Our second expectation that we chatted through last week was uh, on the, the U.S. House and who would control the U.S. House following these elections. It was our expectation, again, as well as much of the market, that the House would remain in Democratic control. And that certainly is the case here. The Democrats did lose a handful of seats to Republicans, but ultimately the Democrats remained solidly in control of the House. The third piece was control of the U.S. Senate. Uh, And here, there was some expectation in the market that the Democrats would pick up a significant number of seats and ultimately therefore control the House, the Senate, and the White House. This was our expectation as well, though we certainly didn't put it at as high odds as we put uh, of Joe Biden winning the presidency. But nonetheless, uh, what we do see today, there are two Senate seats that have remained to be called, though they are likely to go to the Republicans. So the Republicans, after those two races are called, will have 50 seats in the U.S. Senate and the Democrats will have 48. Now, there are two seats that will remain outstanding. Uh, and they're both in the state of Georgia. So in the state of Georgia, if neither candidate receives at least 50% of the vote, then that particular race needs to go to a runoff. In Georgia, that's what we're seeing with the two Senate races that are currently ongoing. So both of them, more likely than not, will go to a runoff in January. So it's not until January that we'll know which party ultimately controls the Senate. Now, this is incredibly important. If the Democrats control the Senate and obviously already control the House and the White House, the ability for Joe Biden to put forward more sweeping plans on the regulatory front, uh, expanding health care, for example, raising taxes on corporates and high income individuals, putting forward a bigger infrastructure package, um, all of that would be considerably easier for him to do. If Republicans still control the Senate, then we would expect many of those plans to be curtailed. So if we look at what Joe Biden can do as president uh, immediately and what he's likely to do, um, one would be opening up America's borders uh, with some immigration reform, COVID notwithstanding. It's likely that the U.S. uh, would start to reach out to allies and resume cooperation that had been uh, hindered during the Trump administration. It's likely that he would quite quickly rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, uh, rejoin the World Health Organization, for example. But as I mentioned, On the stimulus side, the Democrats had been expected to put forward a package uh, up to two and a half trillion dollars. If Republicans end up controlling the Senate, then that package is likely to be closer to a trillion dollars, so significantly smaller. And also on the infrastructure side, Democrats were likely to put forward an infrastructure plan uh, really with a significant portion of spending in the green energy space, also in excess of two trillion dollars over the first four years. That too is likely to be 
curtailed uh, and may be only about a trillion dollars. But with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy to chat through the implications as it relates to South Africa. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for those well articulated thoughts. So what have we seen from an SA perspective post the election? Well, we are seeing many of the moves we pointed to last week. One of those was that we thought a Biden pres presidency would lead to a stronger RAND, and we have seen that come to fruition with the RAND continuing to strengthen post the election. Then precious metals like gold and platinum shares have also outperformed as markets expect a larger budget deficit in the US. And we saw a positive reaction from Tencent, which drove NASPIS and Process higher. And then on the negative side, Sassel underperformed this week over concerns that a Biden presidency will be negative for fossil fuels like oil. And interestingly, British American tobacco reacted negatively as investors price in increased regulatory risk. It seems plausible that higher excise increases and a menthol ban are more likely under Democratic leadership. And as we know, the Democrats favor lifting corporate taxes, which we estimate could shave about 3% of the fair value of BAT if enacted. So where to from here and what should investors be watching? In SA, we are closely watching how the Democrats plan to influence the motor vehicle market. Mixed changes from combustion engines to electric and hydrogen vehicles have implications for the platinum group metals. We'll also be watching how US-China relations play out. At this point, it looks like the Chinese are cautious about a Biden presidency. So let's see how trade relations progress there. And then again, we can't get away from COVID, unfortunately. As infections rise in the US, the question is, how well can Biden manage the impact on the economy? One tail risk we are keeping an eye on here is rising inflation. We have seen very benign inflation in the US since the GFC, but we are seeing PMI start to turn up globally. If one considers that COVID has brought about big supply side disruptions at the same time as governments are strongly boosting entitlements, I think you can make the case that inflation is something we should be watching. Certainly with very low global yields, there isn't much inflation risk priced into bond markets. So a potential tail risk at this point, certainly not part of our base case, but something we're keeping an eye on. Brian, how are you managing these developments in the international portfolios? Thank you, Nancy. That was very helpful. For us on the international side, um, which I know is uh, the same with you in South Africa as well, we're very conscious about not making zero one bets. And I think as evidenced by how close these Senate races are, for example, and how who ultimately controls the Senate will have a significant impact on policy going forward, it's very important for us that we're not making a bet on one party controlling over the other. So we're focused on finding companies that can not only survive, but thrive in either scenario uh, and, and managing the portfolio accordingly. So thank you everyone for joining us this week, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take care.